Now, to everyone's surprise, the ship didn't come to a stop over Manhattan or Washington or Chicago, but it instead coasted to a halt directly over the city of Johannesburg. The doors didn't open for three months. It just hovered there. Nobody could get in. And they eventually decided, after much deliberation, that the best thing to do would be to physically cut their way in. January 2005, when we shot uh, Alive in Joburg, the previous year, I think, Neil had sort of called me and said he's got this crazy idea of putting um, aliens in a township environment and wants to shoot it like a documentary. When I made Alive in Joburg, I just wanted to see this kind of crazy North American or, you know, English sci-fi aspect put into this third world setting and see what that looks like. I ended up being in that short. Jason Cope, who's also in this film, plays CJ, was the production manager on, on Alive. There wasn't necessarily any story-related ingredients in that. There was thematic and visual ingredients. I, I guess the unique part of the idea is that they are homeless. They pitch up on our doorstep. Uh, entirely destitute, they're starving, their ship doesn't work, you know, they, they basically, they floated to Earth in their life raft. While I was doing Alive in Joburg, I was actively looking for ways to get into directing feature films. And my agent had given my stuff to Mary Parent, who was going to produce Halo. We first met Neil when we were considering the production of a uh, film called Halo, based on the video game. As it was, Halo never happened. The moment that film collapsed, when I was getting ready to sort of pack up and leave, Fran Walsh, it was actually Fran's idea, she was like, why don't we just keep all of the momentum and the energy going that we have here, and just do another film. Neil had this wacky idea for District 9, which he pitched to us. And we loved working with Neil so much that uh, we thought it would be fun to turn District 9, his idea, into a feature film. We sat around for quite a while, inventing all these characters and, and what way to best tell the story of that world. So it does, we don't change its role. That's what it does. We went for about, probably about two months of just collaborating face to face on the different stories and the characters. And, but when it actually got down to writing the nuts and the bolts, we worked very much alone. It was a good collaboration and we'd really, you know, I'd, I'd put the elements out there, she'd write some stuff, I'd write some stuff, we'd, we'd swap it around. So it's quite collaborative. Obviously the idea that the creatures, you know, when eventually aliens came, they wouldn't come to New York and try and destroy New York. They wouldn't have, you know, necessarily way more advanced cultures and all the answers for humanity. They might actually be able to be oppressed by human beings and, and actually therefore be weaker in a sense. I think that the short history before the film takes place is that some sort of virus sort of, uh, you know, burnt like wildfire through the ship and, and killed off the upper echelons of their society and they were the ones that stayed alive. I feel like we probably constructed about at least 10 different stories with different characters. We had, we, we had boards and pictures and things all over the place. Within this framework, there are our characters, and the larger framework is that the aliens are oppressed, and, and the humans, for the most part, directly or indirectly, are responsible for that. Yeah, when I watched... And setting out to write a science fiction film in South Africa, there's a fine line between you want to pay attention to the politics of the country, but you want the science fiction to be an adventure. South Africa has such a racially charged background, and it has such a it has such a, a history that adding this third alien element to it can make it a really interesting place for the film to 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 take place in. But if you're not careful, it can become too complex, and it become it can sort of become too cumbersome. Neil was very adamant during the entire writing process that this isn't a political statement film. First and foremost, it's meant to entertain. What I personally like about District 9 is its originality. I really haven't seen a film quite like this. When we were writing the first draft of the script, it was kind of the sky's the limit. We didn't want to limit what we were putting down. At least I didn't want to limit what I was thinking of by budget constraints. I think at the beginning of the process, I was writing things with, with that knowledge. I was 
holding back in places because I knew how much work certain things would be. The combination of, of science, of fiction, and comedy. I mean, at its heart, it's a, it's a very funny movie. His mind is incredibly free with, with all of that. You know, he just, he just, whatever is cool, he'll just do. Neil wanted the aliens to look very much like insects. He liked the idea that they're like worker bees. We were always talking about them having a hive mentality. That's definitely one of the ways that he's affected things, is to kind of break some of that down in me and go like, just do whatever you want. Just do it, you know, we'll figure it out. We still have a limited budget. This isn't a massive film, so there are constraints that, that have to be obeyed. Just, just, just go over there. Let me just... Might be a bit yeah. higher. Yeah. yeah. I think I think that'll work. I mean, I think I think his if every single soldier has one on his right arm and then on his left arm we have our ID. Yeah. I think that'll totally unify them. I felt really creatively energized when we were coming up with the film. And pre-production is is uh, you know from a design perspective and and bringing things to life because you really actually bring them to life. I think in a way prior to shooting. The actors will bring the characters to life, but everything, even the characters to a certain degree, and their wardrobe, and just what they are, gets created a long time before you're on set. Shirley, are, are we going to have like a long wardrobe session with him? Obviously, there's a few yeah. hours, yeah. Yeah, 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 no, totally, totally. This is this is really for tomorrow, tomorrow even though yeah. we're isolating, yeah, like it's yeah. starting to get but very But at least close. you've got yeah. a feeling yeah. of the look. Yeah. So I can go and get, once we've got the day breakdown, because well, I'll know yeah. exactly how many outfits and whether yeah. we need multiple, because for some of them we're going to need. Yeah. It was a combination of stuff when during rehearsals what, what we would do is we would work downstairs in the basement and we would just continuously come up with a variety of different characters every single day. Is this a weapon? <laughs> and then he would sort of give us guidance every two days as to what he did and didn't like. The basic idea it definitely spawned from the idea of, of two races meeting at one another's doorstep. I mean, that, that is what South Africa is. There's absolutely no question South Africa is about that. I feel very grateful that we're in a position to make a film that is set in South Africa, that features South African actors in this way, and that deals with this kind of subject matter.